heat contemplates body as body internally, he contemplates body as body externally. This is another uh, controversial <coughs> place. People uh, interpret this, uh, this statement in a different way. Uh, contemplating body as body internally, some people think uh, contemplating inhaling and contemplating body as body externally, they interpret as exhaling. <coughs> this is uh, uh, not inconsistent with the teaching. It is inconsistent, not consistent. Because uh, internally here means uh, uh, one's own breathing, externally means others breathing. So people wonder how can one know uh, the breathing of other people, other people's breathing. What it means is uh, once uh, one understands the entire breathing process, entire breath body, uh, what happens to one's own breathing, and then one can inferentially know what happens to other people's breathing. Therefore, externally means uh, the breath of everybody else other than oneself. And this statement we can see at the end of every passage. Uh, every uh, uh, foundation of mindfulness. For instance, uh, uh, regarding the feelings, consciousness, and uh, uh, mental activities, volitional formations. So it is uh, gaining knowledge of one's own breathing process quite thoroughly, quite well, in order to gain the, in order to have an inferential understanding, inferential knowledge of what happens to the breath of other beings, other persons. As I mentioned earlier in another point, at another point that <coughs> this kind of uh, uh, seeing the universe, universal nature of breathing uh, helps us to relate to all other living beings. Also to practice metta, uh, compassion, uh, appreciative joy, and equanimity. To practice the four Brahma Viharas, this kind of insight, understanding is important. Then Next is, uh, this is the part of insight, as you see in the heading, uh, one has to have this insight. The insight is that the breath is universal, that we are all bound by this universal factor. One has to be very mindful, insightful, to gain that understanding. That is one insight we gain. Second insight is he dwells contemplating states that arises in the body. This is uh, not very clear. What it means is samudhe dhamma pasiva kāsmin viharati, which means uh, seeing the rising nature of uh, the body. 
rising nature of the body. A rising nature here means uh, inhaling. When we inhale, we can see the breath body starts, begins, arise, takes birth. Rising nature is uh, the nature of inhaling. That means when we inhale, breath starts. The, the breath takes uh, birth, so to say, rising nature, rising nature. Also, when we breathe in, we can feel the rising of our abdomen, uh, expanding of our chest, and expanding of our body. We feel that is called rising nature, rising nature. So we, uh, when we breathe in, we become mindful of a rising nature. Here Dhamma means nature. Samudaya Dhamma means a rising nature. As you know, the word Dhamma is used for nature. Like uh, Jara Dhamma. Jara Dhamma is nature of decay or decaying nature. Vyadi Dhamma, decaying of sickness or what you call nature of sickness. Uh, that is uh, uh, not sickening nature but the, the natural process that uh, happens to make us fall sick. That is, uh, so the nature, uh, the Dhamma is used for nature. Uh, in addition to the main uh, popular meaning is uh, teachings of the Buddha. Then why Dhamma Anupasiva Ka is being Viharati? One uh, lives uh, or stays uh, noticing, becoming mindful of the disappearing nature, falling nature of the body. Falling nature is exhaling. When we exhale, you can see the, uh, the breath falls, disappears, passes away. Vaya dhamma, vaya means uh, disappearing. Sabbe, uh, uh, sankara, anicca, dada, no, uh, uh, anicca, avata, sankara, upada, vaya, dhammino. They are, vaya means passing away, disappearing, losing. Uh, Wire also is used for expenses. Aya, <laughs> wire. Gaining and losing. So, uh, when we breathe out, our abdomen shrinks, body shrinks, breath fades away, and one becomes, one uh, stays being mindful of that nature, disappearing nature of the breath. It is also easier to remember when we take, when we uh, take a long breath or when the breath is long, we can become mindful of rising nature of the breath. When the breath is long, exhaling is long, we can become mindful of the falling nature of breath. When the breath is uh, faster, we become mindful of rising and falling nature. You see, when the breath is long, one moment we can become mindful of rising nature. Next moment, 
become mindful of falling nature, disappearing nature. When breath becomes uh, quick, rasang vasa santo rasang asana, quick, when the breath becomes quick, then rising and falling nature is you know, easy to notice. So, Samudaya Vaya Dhamma Anupasiva Kaisami Virati means rising, one stays being mindful for seeing, rising and falling. Anupasi Virati, seeing one stays. Seeing, seeing means not seeing with eyes, but seeing with I wish them I, seeing with mind. That means being fully aware of that nature. Anupasi uh, is used for mental seeing, not seeing with physical eyes. Okay. Then uh, another insight arises, or else he meant he uh, maintains the mindfulness that. There, that there is a body. That there is a body just sufficient for knowing and awareness. The body is uh, Jnana mattaya pati sati mattaya. The body exists for us to become aware that it is there. That means the, the breath becomes so subtle that there is very uh, subtle awareness that the body, body is there. And also, body is there for knowing and awareness, and he dwells independent, not clinging to anything in the world. The body is there for us to gain knowledge, wisdom, awareness, understanding of rising and falling, not to cling to it. When there is body, we feel the rising and falling. When there is body, we see, we feel feel the experience in permanence. But, and therefore we must become aware of the fact that the body is there for us to gain the insight into rising and falling, appearing and disappearing, but not to cling to. Not clinging to anything in the world. Here world means uh, not external world, but the body. So, without clinging to the body, we become aware that it is there for us to gain insight into impermanence, rising and falling, rising and falling. Now, in the mindfulness training, This is the theme. This is what we always see. We, we use the, in this case, we use, now we use the body to see rising and falling, appearing and disappearing. When we go to the consciousness, also we repeat the same thing. We become aware of the existence of consciousness for us to gain insight into rising and falling. 
falling. So here we stay with knowing that the body exists, mindfulness that there is body just sufficient for knowing and awareness. Knowing and awareness of what? Knowing and awareness of impermanence. Since there is body, we experience, we know impermanence. And then, we, we, it is uh, uh, very uh, uh, important to understand that it is they are not for us to cling to because when something rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling, even if we want to cling to, we cannot cling. Because the moment we try to cling, either it appeared or disappeared. When something arises, when we try to cling to it, it disappears. So there is no chance to grip, to hold on to it. And when we see very clearly, it is just like trying to balance a mustard seed in the moving tip of a needle. <laughs> Rising and falling takes place so quickly. The moment we try to grab, it's gone. Therefore, the body exists for us to gain this insight. But don't be foolish to cling to it. That would be a losing battle. You cannot cling to it. Although unmindfully, uh, because of our ignorance, we cling to things, cling to people, cling to places, cling to situations, but we cannot do that. And this is a very subtle insight we gain when we see rising and falling. Then, this is how Buddha said, this is how a bhikkhu or meditator who tries to practice mindfulness uses the breath as a body, as a part of the body to gain this insight. You know, sometimes um, at this point I like to uh, bring some very practical things. You know, this uh, uh, four foundations of mindfulness, when we uh, read and learn, it so neatly arranged. As I mentioned several times before, in practice they don't happen that way. The moment we gain little awareness of the breath and breath becomes, see, pasambhayankaya sankaram, breath becomes relaxed. When breath becomes relaxed, it becomes very subtle and our uh, awareness of rising and falling uh, takes place and that moment the body is, when the mind, uh, the, the breath is subtle and relaxed, our, the, our rest of the gross body also becomes subtle and relaxed. That is the moment Mara invades our mind. Mara sends its army. As I said, even the Buddha had to fight with this Mara, the Bodhisattva had to fight this Mara for a long period of time. Uh, that first army 
that Mara sends is very sweet, very lulling, soothing, comforting, peaceful feeling to put us to sleep. <laughs> and we like it very much. As soon as the breath becomes subtle and calm and relaxed and body calm, peaceful, relaxed, relax, then the Mara like a leech, you know, try to suck our blood. Sin leads army and put to go. Sleep, sleep baby, sleep, <laughs> sleep, sleep. Oh, Mara tells that, and we easily succumb to sleepiness. When sleepiness comes, if you all know, it is extremely difficult to fight. How can you fight when, some, when a friend comes to you? <laughs> you like to welcome the friend. It is very rude to chase away a friend. So you welcome the friend. Sleepiness is very sweet, isn't it? Have you found sleepiness coming with uh, anger, with uh, pain? No, sleepiness always comes with pleasure, joy. So you slowly welcome it. When sleepiness comes, you are very much like in a prison. What happens when you're in a prison, you don't know what is going on outside prison walls. You are locked in. Oh, oh when sleepiness takes a grip or hold of your mind, you are so confused you even don't know what's happening. It is just like uh, 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 like uh, uh, muddy water. When the water is muddy, you cannot see your reflection in that water. Similarly, when sleepiness comes, you cannot see this insight. You cannot gain this insight. Before you gain this insight, you succumb to sleepiness. So you got to overcome that, as I mentioned yesterday, using one of those methods that I mentioned. Try to remember some of those methods to overcome sleepiness. Uh, in the discourse itself does not give us um, ways of overcome sleepiness. Uh, there are other places uh, in commentaries and other sutras it, themselves, we find uh, ways of overcoming sleepiness. Some of them I mentioned. One is uh, visualizing bright light, that is Buddha called Aloka Sanya, perception of bright light. If you have a good imagination, it is very easy for you to visualize bright light. Because sleepiness is like darkness. When light arises, darkness disappears. Sleepiness is sleepiness that comes during our meditation is a part of our eternal slumber. That is a part of our ignorance. Because of our ignorance, we welcome sleepiness. And just like darkness uh, of ignorance, sleepiness also makes us, makes our mind dark. To combat that, to fight that army of Mara, we use bright light. Sleepiness disappears. If you cannot do that, uh, your imagination is not very powerful, then you might use some other methods, like as I mentioned, you know, pinching your earlobes hard enough, uh, 
not with the with your nails, but thumb and index finger, pinch hard enough. So will you will wake up. And if that doesn't work, you stand up and stay meditating, standing, doing standing meditation. Standing meditation is one of the postures. When you when we come to the postures, we will discuss that. That is perfectly all right for you to get up, stand, and stay focusing your mind on your standing positions and doing standing meditation. When we come to the postures, we will discuss how we do standing meditation. But as a technique, remember this is one of the techniques of overcoming sleepiness. Then, if that doesn't work, do walking meditation. That also is very highly recommended to activate the body, make the body energetic and create some uh, energy. If that doesn't work, then you may uh, sit and take a deep breath and hold it. Hold as long as you can. But however, if you have heart problems, don't try to hold your breath. Uh, if you don't have, if your health is normal, <coughs> hold the breath as long as you like, as soon as you can, and then slowly breathe out. And do it many times to warm up the body. And you even might perspire, then sleepiness disappears. And if that doesn't work, you wash your face with cold water. And all these are recommended by the Buddha. And finally, Buddha himself has recommended, uh, if none of these things works, go and have a nap. Of course, that is uh, not uh, succumbing to uh, sleepiness or uh, accept the defeat of Maras in the, in the battle, but uh, it's a temporary measure to overcome your sleepiness. Now, you come back to a meditation. You start with your breathing. Start where you stopped. Start, you return to the place where you stopped. Suppose you come and you, uh, you feel uh, asleep at the time when the breath is calm, relaxed, peaceful, and you come back to that. It's easy to come back to that place very quickly. And then again try to see the rising and falling of the breath. And then try not to cling to that breath. Let it go. Then you have all the uh, fought with your sleepiness and you overcome sleepiness. Now you came back. Then Mara sent his second army. Then you have to find your second line of defense. What is the second army Mara sends? The opposite of sleepiness, restlessness and worry. <laughs> because you managed to overcome sleepiness and then you went to the other sp uh, spectrum of the, the same army. Sleep, uh, restlessness and worry arises uh, because you feel guilty that you lost a lot of time in your meditation because you spend a lot of time in trying to overcome your sleepiness and you feel guilty. Or you remember suddenly that you have uh, done something wrong. Uh, or something, you have done something incomplete. Or you have something to do in future. 
or you may people find one thing or another all the time to worry. If you are a parent, you may be worrying, I don't know what my children are doing at home. I don't know whether they had enough food, whether they went to bed on time, whether they read, did their homework, whether they went to school. I don't know whether my husband or wife, whatever, my spouse is doing now. So they find one reason, one thing or another to worry. In the income tax, uh, you know, the stock market or uh, wars or some diseases or SARS or anthrax or something, they keep worrying. <laughs> so, when they worry, they become restless. Therefore, this worry and restless always go together hand in hand as a pair. At that time, we are going to use a method to overcome restlessness and worry. Now, restlessness and worry we find in the sutta at the end. I mean, this, this what you call hindrances you find at the end. But when you sit to meditate, you don't, you don't wait until the end of the sutra to have this experience. <laughs> As I said, when you go to the kitchen, you, when you want to cook, you pick, grab whatever you want at that time. Similarly, when you meditate, the things that is mentioned at the very end can happen at the very beginning. Or something that mentioned in the middle can happen at the beginning. Something that is mentioned at the beginning can happen at the end. So, it happens any time in zigzag in a very sporadic, a very um, unorganized, uh, unsystematic way. So, our duty as mindful meditators is to identify that particular thing when it happens and remain mindful and use mindfulness and do what is necessary at that time, either to cultivate it or to overcome it. If something wholesome happens, we cultivate it. If something unwholesome happens, we get rid of it. So, in this case, this may be possible place where hindrances will appear. That is when the body and mind are relaxed. So, when we overcome one hindrance, another will appear. So, in this case, suppose restlessness and worry arose, then we have to do something about it. What should we do? When restlessness and worry arises, we cannot activate the mind, we cannot arouse our energy. Then restlessness, worry become even stronger. We become more restless, more agitated. At that time we have to use, this is where we need the understanding of uh, balancing of spiritual faculties. Spiritual faculties are faith, perseverance, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. These five are called spiritual faculties. We have to use them whenever and wherever necessary. In this case, we have to use my, uh, concentration in order to combat restlessness and worry. What should we do to gain concentration at that time? Something very concentration and sometimes arise very natural when everything is calm and peaceful, concentration arises. But sometimes in situations like this, when he, the restlessness and worry arise, uh, we have to do something deliberately, pur pur purposely, even forcefully to um, gain some concentration. I recommend uh, using the breath and count the breath, counting the breath. 
counting in uh, has to be a very special kind of counting, special way of counting. Uh, not counting from one to one million indefinitely. <coughs> but counting only from one to ten. You breathe in, breathe out and count one. Not out loud but just mentally count one. And then breathe in, breathe out, count two. Breathe in, breathe out, count three. So you go on up to ten and stop there at ten. And then start counting from breathe in, breathe out, ten, breathe in, breathe out, nine, breathe in, breathe out, eight, and come down to one, like that. Second time, go from one to nine, and stop at nine, count breathe in, breathe out, nine, breathe in, breathe out, eight, and come down to one. Third time go from 1 to 8, 8 to 1. Next from 1 to 7, 7 to 1, 1 to 6, 6 to 1, 1 to 5, 5 to 1, 1 to 4, 4 to 1, 1 to 3, 3 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 1 and 1. The secret of, of this counting is that when you count, say, uh, from a count up to, say, six, then mind wander, begins to wander. All of a sudden you realize, gee, I was counting up to six, then mind wandered. When you come back, you don't remember whether to count from six to seven or six to five. You see? So you got to start everything all over again. And then keep counting again. And if mind wanders again, the same thing will happen. You get confused. So you got to make a commitment, determination, not to let the mind wander. And that way, the mind learns to stay on one object without wandering. So counting we do only for this kind of purpose, to keep the mind on one place, to overcome particularly this hindrance. Restlessness and worry is like um, slavery. A slave is always uh, restless. Why? Because slave worries. Worries that he would be scolded, reprimanded, punished, or thrown out of the house into the street by the slave master if he does not do his duty properly. So, slave is always on his nerves trying to please the slave master and therefore always full of uh, worries and full of restlessness. Buddha said the mind is very much like that when we are, when, the, when it is affected by restlessness and worry. Or it is just like a, a container of water with ripples wind blowing, it forms ripples, bubbles all the time. You cannot see your face in that water. No reflection can be seen. Similarly, when restlessness and worry uh, is active, you cannot see things clearly. Our purpose is to see things clearly or to gain concentration. Now I am giving these suggestions, although we are practicing mindfulness, at the end of the discourse, Buddha has mentioned hindrances. So um, we got to know how we deal with hindrances when they arise, whenever they arise. 
and then we come back to our breath, our practice, whatever it is. If we were focusing mind on our feelings or something else, uh, suddenly another hindrance can arise. Assume this time uh, doubt arises. Doubt regarding the, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and morality. These are the four places mainly hin uh, the, the hindrance of doubt can arise. Doubt about the Buddha means uh, it, it's possible for an average person who has not attained enlightenment to have a doubt about the Buddha's own enlightenment. One might think, gee, I don't know whether this is the right method that he taught. I remember uh, in some retreats, people come to us when they have a lot of pain and they try and try and try and finally they come for an interview and they say, gee, but there must be something else not mindfulness. And somebody said, Bhante, I asked somebody to commit suicide rather than practicing mindfulness. <laughs> because this doesn't seem to work. Buddha has made a mistake. <laughs> so some people think that way. It is possible. Doubt can arise. Not knowing not understanding one's own inability, one's own weakness, one would always try to find some faults somewhere and start doubting. They doubt about the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and the discipline. The meditation itself is a discipline. They doubt about this discipline. When doubt arises, we have to um, do something about it. Doubt is like um, traveling in a desert where there are no roads, no directions, no people, no signs, nothing you are right, you know, traveling in the sky. So, when doubt arises, we have to arouse our confidence. Confidence in, uh, uh, as, uh, the, in the first place, confidence in our own achievement. At least we, we will have pain. And then, we have a moment that pain fades away. That means pain is not something permanent. When we see that, that gives us confidence. Buddha said the, the source of confidence is suffering. Source of confidence is suffering. When you have suffering, you have seen suffering arising many times in your life and that suffering did not stay forever. Suffering arises, it passes away. Pain arises, it passes away. When we know the pain arising and passing away after a while, that gives us confidence into the reality of impermanence. So, we have to deepen our understanding of impermanence of suffering in order to arouse our confidence. That means, we are practicing something with hope, not 
with hopelessness. <coughs> Hope gives us confidence, confidence makes us strong in our practice. When confidence arises, we become strong, we become glad and we come back to the practice. Then arises the fourth hindrance. I mentioned them not exactly in a particular order, but they can arise in this any, any time. The hindrances arises in arise in different ways in different persons depending upon their own personality temperaments. Another hindrance can arise that is maybe anger or hatred. That is a very big hindrance. Uh, anger can arise as a just um, a simple, very weak uh, uh, annoyance. If we don't take care of that annoyance at that time, it can turn into irritation. If the irritation is not taken care of, it can turn into a sort of anger. And if anger is not taken care of at that time, it turns into grudge, hatred. So, as it arises, we must do something about it to get rid of it. I have a, a, a great uh, uh, deal of things to say about uh, anger and how to overcome anger. Perhaps uh, it needs uh, one whole uh, entire, uh, you know, an hour or so to, to speak about it. <coughs> but this time, uh, I just uh, mentioned uh, that we must uh, uh, at least try to feel the impact of anger and see how painful it is. Our practice of meditation is to overcome pain caused by one thing or another, including anger, and therefore first we see the impact of anger, the pain that causes uh, the, 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 the anger causes. So other things I mentioned uh, some other times because I want to end this uh, session. Uh, anger, when anger arises, uh, we are very much, our mind is very much like uh, uh, a sick mind. A oh, person with anger is like a sick person. Sick person is uh, one who cannot, especially somebody who is suffering from um, something like um, hepatitis or what we call jaundice, uh, may not taste food because it affects taste buds. Any delicious food would taste bland, tasteless. Similarly, when angry person, when, when anger arises, that person with anger will not be able to appreciate anything in the world. Any good thing that anybody has turns out to be unpleasant, unacceptable thing for that person. So hateful person never appreciates anything in any other person or in the world because his state of mind is very uh, negatively affected. So Buddha compared him to a sick person. Or when the hate is uh, uh, active, that state of mind is compared to boiling water. 
when the water is boiling, you cannot see your own reflection in that water, neither can you touch it. So is angry person when he is, when the anger is very strong. As you all understand, when we are angry, our anger can destroy all our noble things. Our patience, our mindfulness, somebody may be practicing meditation for a long period of time and over a little thing suddenly the person gets so angry that the person will do something totally, completely unmindful, completely different from what he has been practicing all his meditation time. And he will regret for the rest of his life. I don't have to give any examples, you all know what uh, we do when we are very angry, so many nasty things we can do. And the rest of our, then we will regret at the, in the rest of our life. So, <coughs> uh, in meditation, when anger arises, we immediately must take care of it by using uh, at least our metta, because that is the time mind is relatively uh, calm and uh, our met mindfulness already, we have started practicing mindfulness, during that time anger arises, so we should be able to overcome that with mindfulness. Don't let the mindfulness uh, be on the book and uh, uh, anger dominate the mind. And the last uh, hindrance that can arise, by the way, all of them may not be, may not arise at the same time. That means when one, when you overcome one, other will not come necessarily at that time. It may arise some other time. But we must, we must know a technique of overcoming them whenever they arise. All the five hindrances are mentioned in a list, in one place. But even they will not arise in that order at one particular time. Sometimes you may not have any of them. Sometimes you may have all of them. Sometimes you may have one of them. At one time you have one that in, during that session, you may not have any other hindrance. So, we got to understand the, the way how these things arise and be mindful to tackle them as they arise or when they arise. But we have to know ways of overcoming or handling them. The last hindrance that can arise is greed, clinging, craving, attachment. And that is why this discourse began with dealing with two hindrances. What are the two hindrances that dealt with at the very beginning? Abhijja domanasam, craving and hatred, anger, disappointment. Having, because these are the two main uh, hindrances actually that uh, bugs our mind, that troubles our mind. Either greed or hatred, uh, clinging or rejection, grasping or rejection. Uh, these two things can, can happen because this is the, the very uh, nature of our mind. If something very pleasant, we grab it. If it is unpleasant, we reject it. Buddha said, without grabbing, holding on to anything, without rejecting anything, keep the mind in balance to see what really is happening. That is mindfulness. 
not going into one extreme or the other, stay in the middle. <coughs> so when greed arises, come back to mindfulness to let go anisito chaviharati natakinchuloku padiyati. Come back to that statement. Anisito chaviharati. Anisita means dependent upon or clinging, craving. And Buddha said the Upanisha Sutta nisitancha chalati. When we depend on something, we are shaky <laughs> because uh, our state of mind, our state depends on something else. When that changes, that is shaken, is that is shaking, we also will be shaken up. So, anisitoju uh, viharati means don't uh, dependent, uh, don't be dependent upon anything. Try to keep the mind independent of clinging, craving, grasping. That's another part of mindfulness. So, uh, when greed arises, try to um, remain unattached. Um, and remain mindful. I think that is enough for today as Dhamma talk and we will continue this. <laughs>